You know that old 1950s 14 foot bee hole sitting in the backyard rotting? Turns out with a little renovation, they make quite nice fishing boats. You build them correctly, they'll go through anything. This video is to show you how to do just that. The weekend warrior kits aren't just for John boats anymore. I did initially do a time lapse and a follow up of this boat, but most people did not actually care for the time lapse and wanted commentary. So here we are to explain exactly what I did to this boat because I guess a few things weren't terribly clear. If you want the kit we built this boat with, you can find it here at tbnation.net. Search Weekend Warrior Build. We have everything from basic all the way to pro level, and we show you how to do it here. One thing unique about this boat is that it's so old that it actually had wooden gunnels and end caps. Can you believe that? In the 1950s, that was just the styling trend. To get around this, we need to make new gunnels. How I did this is I had 1 16th by 3 4 inch 6063 aluminum square tube, and I bent it with a series of clamps into the gunnel. I'm not actually even sure if this is the boat's original shape, but now it is. This is the only way that I've been effectively able to refit gunnels at a DIY level with just pop rivets. Any other way would require some sort of welding or press or extrusion. You would have to self-order this directly from a metal shop and you would want it delivered uncut. That way you can get the full length of the gunnel. I had these cut. That was a mistake. There was no way I could fix it. I had to actually weld it to get it fixed later on. You want them all the way to that very end where they meet the transom. We stuck in an aluminum transom since we had to replace the transom anyways. The stock transom in this after 70 years on the planet was done for. That transom will last another 70 years though. Have you noticed that the hull is in great shape? It could probably be on this planet another 70 years and you would never know the difference. That's the benefit of aluminum. Now we're at a crucial junction for what we do for the end caps. For one, we got a transom. We sell these aluminum transoms. They just come like this, like a block of wood and you can cut them to fit and shape. Then you recap them. We give you a capping piece and you can also cut and spot that piece in however you need to spot it in. We and my team, however, have never figured out a suitable DIY thing to like sell to the mass for end caps. It's just something you're gonna have to do yourself because every boat is different and there is no universal way to do it. How I did it here is I had this cheap metal brake from Harbor Freight that was just strong enough to bend this 1 16th inch aluminum. And then I had a 090 inch piece that I just had scrap and I heated it up with a torch. You can actually get pretty good results by heating up aluminum that's 5052 or 6063 that's able to be bent and you can go ahead and bend it this way. And as long as you trace it correctly, it'll fit just like this. Then you have to put your spots in. We did rivet one piece, a very strong 1 8 inch angle into the corner. How we did it with rivets and bolts would have actually still worked, but we ended up welding it later just because we had the ability later on in this build where things were happening that we could not get around. One thing we did develop though was a bow plate kit with thick enough aluminum sheeting and thick enough under supports that when you mount it to your boat, it will be stiff enough and rigid enough to hold the boat in place very solid like and also be able to handle the constant flex and torque of a trolling motor without shuddering loose or just wobbling over time. With thinner aluminum tops, you see that. For this piece, which will take an obscene amount of beating, I would not group the rivets any farther apart than three inches. And keep in mind that the more rivets, the better. So two inches or one and a half would even be more. And we also pair this with one by two by one eighth inch square tubing that you can rivet underneath and right here at the one spot and then also underneath tactfully wherever your trolling motor is going to be. You definitely want a brace that just takes the entire scissor mount or the entire quick release plate of where that trolling motor is. That way it can take the brunt of the actual flex. And now for this pesky floor we have. We developed a subfloor kit specifically for boats like this. We got questions years on end of how you get around with boats that were designed like this with these ribs that would not drain out water. The only option that we have truly is to make a higher floor and one with a nice middle channel that will just channel the majority of the water directly down that area. This is just an overview, but we have really extensive videos on this process and we will link that playlist in the description below. We fit the sides in with two part AB pour foam and we put garden hose in there as drainage. Like later on tactfully, we're gonna have probably open compartments somewhere here and those will actively add as drainage that will bypass the sides. We get a lot of complaints from professional tradesmen in the boat industry about pour foam, but here's the whole thing. A lot of these boats that have pour foam in them are extremely poorly designed, which what we do here meticulously is to get around a lot of those issues that we've seen where pour foam stacks and just sits there and saturates with water. Also, storing your boat correctly is a huge thing between it because we've gutted boats 50, 60 years old and there is no corrosion and no saturated foams because it's people who own those boats. 
actually stored them correctly. Now that we're past that point, we are here to do the subfloor. We took foam board from Hobby Lobby, cut it tactfully, glued it together, and then just use that as template to actually make for the subfloor. This is a wooden subfloor. I think this is three eighths. Should probably went with half inch, but we were trying to like kind of be conscious of weight here. So three eighths is a pretty good spread of strength to weight ratio as long as the underneath is solid. We used a hole saw for every point where the garden hose was sticking out and then we just cut everything else with either a jigsaw or a skill saw that is small and tactful enough to counter the curve of the actual subfloor because you know the whole boat tapers and the subfloor has to taper. Crucial tip, keep in mind that whatever foam you choose down there at the bottom, that pink foam board or styrofoam will melt in the presence of gasoline spilling down there. If you have an electric only boat, it doesn't matter obviously, but if you're gonna run a gas outboard and gas does get down there, be very conscious and very careful because it will implode your subfloor and it'll sink. So we gridded the subfloor and we use one inch rivets through the floor into the aluminum frame that we do sell with these kits. This weekend warrior build is specifically meant to pair with wood where we make a really good wood aluminum hybrid spread and this was by popular demand of our audience so any spot where wood really does good in we're going to be using it for that and every spot where aluminum is really crucial in we'll be using it for that again with the end caps i chose to go back over it and we got a spool gun and just welded up the end caps normally people don't have to go through this because your boat will probably have at least aluminum casted or welded end caps and the front at least has a casted piece we had none of that and none of it fit after we refitted the, the gunnels the way we did. So we had to just make our own stuff and just do as best we could here. You could also try brazing those corners, but brazing is really hard to get correctly, like in a way that it's cosmetically pleasing and it only is going to bond to the surface, it will not penetrate. Now we are on to the side rails actually fitting those down because that's how we're going to attach the frame. We have used this method for boat building ever since like gen three of framing, which is eons ago. We're like on gen eight. Also quickly, I forgot to tell you, I epoxy coated this subfloor. There is no better way. Marine epoxy, like, like slow cure, and then you can coat it again with fast cure, but slow cure really penetrates in very well and gives that wood a nice palatable coat to where it's gonna have some longevity. I know a lot of people gave me flack, why don't you use aluminum for the subfloor? For one, because the audience didn't want it, and two, because you can epoxy wood and it actually lasts very long, as long as it's not opening and closing. If the wood's just staying there, it does actually a really good job of just staying there and being present and lasting a long time. You can also just drill the bases of your frame right down to the subfloor with screws and just seal them back up with like silicone or 35200. We go ahead and we frame this with our Gen X systems. The Gen X systems are 1 16th inch angle, which is very easy and malleable to work with, can be cut with a bandsaw or even tin snips and put in place very tactfully with rivets. So it's really like DIY friendly, but it's also strong enough to frame all your stuff too. So the combination of a wooden subfloor, wooden side panels, and then eventually we'll be getting to the wooden deck. The wood's gonna work really well for those things, but the bow plate, the end caps, the transom, and all the framing and all the hatches are aluminum. Those crucial components being aluminum will make sure this boat lasts a very long time, even though the majority of it is actually wood. Another thing that will make this boat feel solid, almost like it's a glass boat, is putting in pour foam. What pour foam does is it absolutely 100% contours to the natural shape of the boat and creates a mechanical bond. Each kit gives about 300 pounds of reserve buoyancy if expanded correctly, and there are three kits in there. It's an estimated 900 pounds of reserve buoyancy and also something that solidifies the boat. There is no other option. So I don't know what anyone wants to tell you, but really that's the best option if you want to get some results like that, a really solid filling boat. Now that we're done with that though, let's move on to the deck. We've showed everybody how to drop in the dry lids into the framing and then add sheet metal all around it, but we have not ever showed you how to do it with wood and also how to attach EVA foam to wood correctly. So we cut out the hole size. I got a lot of questions on how, to, how you get the correct measurements for the hatches. The hole size is what you cut out and then there's an inch and a half flange that we marked around there. That's just added to the hatch, but we don't actually count that as part of the hatch. That's just the part that either mounts to the frame that you attach sheet metal around, or the part that you have to recess in with a router and it just fits flush into the actual wood deck. After we have all that routed out, we go ahead and re-resin coat everything. We resin coat all the wood panels. We would resin coat all of the deck with a really like slow curing resin for the first initial penetration. Then you drill holes along the frame of the hatch 
And right now I'm countersinking them with a countersink slash deburring bit, and then I'm putting in countersink wooden screws into the deck. You can put them through the deck into the frame if you want, but it's kind of overkill because we will be attaching the actual deck to the aluminum frame with one inch rivets. We use a wooden dowel bit to kind of countersink into the wood ever so slightly to cover the pan head. And then we go ahead and we shove the one inch rivets right in there and secure it to the frame. You can also just get these one inch rivets in bulk from our website or they do come as an add on for the listing of this kit. One thing to keep in mind, if when you route out the recess for the drop-in and then there are some pretty gnarly voids, you'll have to fill that in with something. You can fill it in with Bondo filler resin at that point in time, or if you have like thickened marine epoxy, which is what we used, which is a lot more expensive and probably overkill. Just as long as you fill the voids and then later on you can sand and make sure everything is flat. You want the deck to be as flat and even as possible, because depending on what kind of turf you're using, especially if you're using like orthodeck, which is like the teak turfing that will show every imperfection in the deck you'll you'll see everything for the camo turf for the hydro turf it's not such a big deal as long as it's camo if it's a solid color you will see it just the, the light shining on it will will just show it it'll be like hey look at me and that goes with aluminum too if there are any gross voids in the deck it will show so you must fill it in with something epoxy in my opinion especially marine epoxy that is meant to pair with aluminum is your best bet I'm a big fan of West Systems 105. I have been told that Armor Light from Hobby Lobby is pretty much its same equivalent and does just as good a job. Never tried it though, but food for thought. Definitely tape the inside the lining of your hatches where you don't want any epoxy to sit on and ruin the actual finish, especially if you got your hatches powder coated. Um, and just only fill in the voids there. Get as much of it as you can and any sort of extra kind of jam it toward the end and see if it'll just drip down into the end towards the side walls and kind of cover that also. Later on, we will actually be sealing that all off with silicone, or if you want 3 and 5200, we'll be doing that before we actually apply the decking. But see how it is all nice and shiny? That's how it should look. You should do initial coat, then sand it so it's nice and flat, and then your finishing coat should be almost completely flat and a very, very nice pliable surface for EVA foam with the adhesive. But before we apply the actual deck, we go ahead and we just paint the inside of the gunnels. This is the only chance we'll actually have to do it. So we take some self etching primer and some black spray paint and we go ahead and we take care of that. Now we can finally seal in the edges of the deck. Remember that we had all those garden hoses there. That was preliminary planning for adding a bunch of compartments there, but since we decided to go conservative and just kind of make catwalks slash benches with battery compartments and we kind of voided the lockers there, we, um, we filled that all with foam. So now that whole side of the deck needs to be sealed. You should seal the deck anyways, it just helps out. But now that we're done with all that and everything's dried and cured, we're gonna go ahead and apply the actual EVA foam decking. This is HydroTurf. This is Gator Cam color. But the HydroTurf decking specifically, I get a lot of questions on how robust it is. It is extremely robust and like anti-wearing. I never really got it. I had people claim to me how tough it is that they go out hunting, they go out in the swamp, they go out in really super harsh climates and get mud and all kinds of stuff on it and buoys and just animals and things on it, blood all over it. And they just, it just washes right out and it hardly creates any sort of damage to the actual foam. And I didn't believe them because before this, all I used was like teak decking, which is very delicate. And if you touch it wrong, you know, it creates a little indent or a void or can mark it. But this stuff really is impervious. It is extremely durable. I cannot believe it. Like I've abused it. I have not washed it. I have not cared to do anything to it. And it still looks almost the exact same as it did when I installed it after months and months of use. It also does really good with baits and hooks all over it and you can pressure wash this on a light setting and if you really need to clean it because you've got some stuff on it, it'll come right out. The hardest thing to install it, if you really care, is just lining up the cut groove so that it's spaced and put out correctly and it all lines up. Now, honestly, if you don't care about the lining up, then it's extremely easy to install. But for those with OCD or just extreme like pet peeves about lineups, that that will be your biggest challenge is to line up all the cut groove correctly, despite the hat just the hatch displacement. You get pretty lucky. You can just line one whole sheet right over the top. The bigger thing is that you can cut this right down the line and place it anywhere. And because it is camo, it always all matches up. So this is actually two sheets and we're just cutting and splicing it in, you can't even actually tell. 
as long as the line down the cut groove that you cut with you know a utility knife is straight and you can just work it in work it in and make sure all your lines around that is correct and then just cut out spots where you need to like right there there's a little bit hanging over the hatch just cut it out threw it out a lot of what you have here will be like not usable after you've made cuts so that's why you need extra sheets so if you have a boat like this that you think will be covered in roughly two to three sheets get four sheets or even five if you're just a little apprehensive also know that all foam no matter what you get teak or camo like this is cut by the machine a certain way that in the light it will shine differently down one end and down the other it'll look flat down one end and sharp down the other so you always kind of want to put your sheet and look at it up and down the sheet in the sun and that will tell you what direction you're supposed to place it in and uh, that way you will get like shiny like lighter and darker spots on the actual turf which may or may not drive you nuts i personally at the end of the day don't care like if i wasn't gonna get a million complaints about how the turf would look i would just put turf on here because you can actually save you could have done this whole boat in two and a half sheets but it took me four sheets to get it all nice and lined up correctly but i would tell you for anybody who's just doing this on a budget the ocd is really not your friend it's labeled a disorder in the dsm for a reason but it is now time for the rigging we actually got everything done in about a week like seven or eight days but what will take another week to do correctly is the rigging wiring just kind of slows you down no matter how fast you try to move it is what it is and this is a pretty simple job this is actually a kit we sell we sell the exact amount of wire and connectors and we give you a nice tv nation switch panel with uh, switches that are actually warranted, so we warranty our stuff and it's pretty easy to install we actually have major wiring videos all over youtube and that's probably what we're most known for aside from like our framing and well obviously building tiny boats so we won't bore you terribly with this rigging we'll just give you an overview of what we're doing right now we are splicing down the wire to make leads that are connect directly to the fuse block slash bush bar combo these leads will actually connect to the fuse part of the block with ring connectors and then turn around with actual female spade connectors that will slide right onto the pins of the switch panel. Then we can make the ground in. We can kind of daisy chain the ground ins together to put right there. And then any sort of ground ins that you have that are already done, you can just mount directly to the block themselves. All positive ends running to the fuse block will be directly from the switch panel and all negative ends will be directly from the accessory or lighting that you are powering up. This boat is fairly conservative and doesn't have a lot. That is per request of the audience. But if you're rigging up a lot of major things, you're going to need a 12 gang fuse block minimum and sometimes two. Now, once it's all done and connected and you got everything where it needs to go, just go ahead and secure that fuse block to a wall very tactfully. And so that the wires are out of the way, but you still have enough play between the fuse block and the switch panel that if you have to troubleshoot the switch panel and pull it out for any reason, that you can go ahead and just do that. Also, I'm going the extra mile to wire loom and label all the wires only because I know that if anything goes wrong, troubleshooting it later will be a nightmare. You will not remember what you did unless you have a photographic memory. Our kit also includes a master cutoff switch that you always should link between the fuse block and the actual power source, which in this case is a 12 volt AGM battery. Before we poured in all that foam, we ran PVC conduits up from the battery wells all the way to the front deck. And that was to channel the trolling motor wire that we include in the kit and also channel any sort of fish finder graphs or additional lighting like the nav lights up there, anything you would need. So the more wire, the more conduits you need, we got away with two. And we made a little faceplate there Generally, I leave the pits though there, a giant open void because you can just throw all your life jackets and crucial items in there and not worry about it and not worry about it being watertight. But because I'm pressed for space because of this layout, I needed an additional space. So I added a makeshift subfloor in there so I could get the dry hatch benefits since that is an actual dry hatch. And now we have a subfloor that will elevate everything above the water. And now it's just down to the final moments of rigging. The inside of the boat is done, but the outside is a problem. I have to now tackle that. I'm going to try and do something that I've never done before. Because I procrastinated thoroughly on painting the outside because of the sheer amount of problems that it took to actually get the paint off. And we did try everything. If you watched the video on how it took, what it took to gut this like 1950s paint, they just made things different back in the day. 
Like nothing in today's time took that paint off that was like legal to get. So what I did was I roughed up the hull with 80 grit and then I aluminum etch washed it with that Total Boat etch wash, let it on for 30 seconds, sprayed it off almost immediately because it was hot outside. You don't want it to dry, otherwise you gotta do things to get it off and that's terrible. And then you let it air dry and then you can put it pretty much any primer you want. So the toughest primer that I found is this like Ace Rust Stop stuff from Ace Hardware. It is the best spray paint I've ever personally used on utilitarian items like this. The initial coat is what it is, but I go ahead and I spray it. I give it some time to dry and then I go ahead and do a second coat. Make sure you cover up all crucial parts. And right now I'm doing this outside kind of sketch like. And so, I'm, I mean, I'm just doing what I got to do to just keep it from painting the motor or painting any of the other parts. That... But after two coats, it is ready to go. We are gonna lightly scuff it up with a scouring pad or a scotch pad, whatever you wanna call it. This will create the most favorable environment for the new paint we're about to apply on to stick and stay on. Before we do that, obviously, we are going to go ahead and clean it with a clean rag and alcohol to get all the dust off and any sort of impurities left. Anything stronger than alcohol will probably take off the primer, just FYI, just use rubbing alcohol. Tape off any all in all crucial areas and then go ahead and apply your paint. Do multiple light coats, which will look better than one heavy coat. It will also dry better. If you give dry and recoat times, those are for the paint to degas correctly. So if it says recoat within one hour, wait till 59 minutes and then recoat it because that's going to be the best result for your actual paint to do it. So you don't have, you know, layers underneath the new layers that are still trying to degas and cure but are now hindered because the new layer was applied too quickly. I have painted this and I have wondered whether it was going to peel or have problems, but it has actually been the best paint job I have ever done as a rattle can job for any boat. Hey guys, if you made it this far, please leave a like and comment and share this video. It helps us trend more than you'll ever know. It helps on all of our social media platforms and we are everywhere. Also check us out on Facebook. We have the largest, fastest growing Facebook group full of people who collaborate and share and show off their stuff. This channel also has exclusive content never released to the YouTube public and is strictly only here for channel members and also for patrons through a separate playlist with the exact same content if you are going through Patreon. And also, but we also have tons of videos available to the YouTube public showing you how to do pretty much everything you see here and it's all sponsored through our website, tvnation.net. Check us out there. What's the most exciting part of building a boat like this? Game day. Having it actually on the water and seeing what it can do. We chose to outfit this boat with an on-the-fly jack plate, a jack plate that always works and never messes up or blows out relays or has freezing hydraulic lines due to temperature changes. We also stuck a 20-horse EFI Mercury Gen 4, their best one yet, and it pushes this boat fantastic. We put a whale tail on it because I wasn't sure how it would handle without it, but it didn't need it. In fact, we maxed out the prop when we took it off, and so it probably needs a higher pitch prop. We could probably get 30 out of this thing, no problem. The benches are nice, everything's nice. I don't like not having a rod locker, but I really like having that big stow area. That big pit is something I've never had in any boat due to all the extreme tackle stuff that I stick in my boat. I also got this off Amazon, this Time USB lithium battery, 100 amp hour. I did replace one of my AGM batteries that didn't do so hot. I replaced it with this one and it worked fantastic for powering the trolling motor. It's been a fantastic addition to this boat ever since I've had it and I've never had to worry about my trolling motor ever dying once. Speaking of trolling motors, I chose to outfit this boat with a Minn Kota V2 Power Drive 55 pound trolling motor with a Pro Nav Angler combo to it. It's a third party navigation spot lock GPS. Features that turn this basic bottom line trolling motor into a pro level system that works fantastic better than some of the other ones on the market. Everything on the boat worked exceptionally well. The boat sat well in the water, had a good draft, did not feel overweighted or disproportioned in any area, got up on plane, had plenty of power. The only thing that I had actual pet peeve about was the lack of storage. Now I am a gigantic tackle junkie. Anybody who's seen my other creations knows that I go all out to create as many hatches, as much storage as possible, the most efficient that I possibly can. So it's the first time I've ever just had a giant cockpit, which I did really appreciate the benefits of that. But I still need to tackle storage. I tried this thing. This is like the normal little pouch storage. We figured if we made someone out of aluminum and we made some other of these just drop in tackle mods right into the cockpit or right alongside the trolling motor, like mount anywhere that there's a vertical or a corner space, you can mount these things and they're fantastic. 
these ones will just straight up mount two small tackle boxes one large one or a series of like small plastic so these became my day boxes i had no day boxes in the boat huge problem if you do that big mistake you need day boxes just regular storage is not enough you need a place to put your phone your soft plastics your now tackle that you need to access here and there like right away if you need to bust into your actual major tackle it's because like your strategy didn't work you need to revert your strategy that takes a lot of time Everything that you do on the water should be about efficiency. Another thing we made were through hole brackets that fit right there on the top of the transom. And those have been exceptionally useful. I am tired of drilling a hole out the side of the boat. That is for old style stuff. It does not work with the new conversion stuff. It is terrible to even try to retrofit that to like a, an upgraded build like this. So the best place to do it is right over the transom. You can see it actually leaving your boat. You know confirmation. Those things are actually working. I also got some seriously robust Hobie T-Tracks and I mounted them to the end caps. Got them from my boys at Southwest Kayaks down here in Havasu. And I have yet to use them, but they look really cool. I ran a dual build setup. I ran a manual auto and then a straight manual one as kind of an auxiliary build, but truly you should just run two manual auto billages. You need two. And also I offset that bottom. I never really show that to anybody, but you see that water floating underneath the back channel. Now if the back pod connects all the way to the bottom of the hull, that's where like the pore foam is like biggest at risk of getting saturated. So we offset that uh, a few inches off the actual bottom just for that. But that's all fine and dandy. I just demoed the boat on like clear water on like the best blue sky day. Oh, look, I even caught a fish. Oh, look at me. Everything's great. Yay. Yeah, not really. What's that saying? Calm seas never made strong captains or vice versa, something like that. What I will tell you, calm lakes never produce big fish, at least not for me. The worst conditions produce big fish. That means I need a boat capable of going to conditions that are questionable. Conditions that are not meant for cowards or the weak. Conditions that only the bold, the people who truly want it, will go into. Conditions that if you fail in it, you don't want it to be by fault of the boat. So you better have made your boat strong. You want to make it conservative? That's one thing. The objective should always be to do dangerous things carefully. That means your boat needs to be carefully built to do dangerous things. And if it's not, well then, that would actually just truly make you stupid, not brave. So, the question will be, during this run, which one was it for me? Was I brave or was I just stupid? I turned off my shallow water alarm, which was stupid because then the water was really cloudy. I could not see the shore. And when I was in the section, the waves coming in and out sucked the water from underneath me and I actually started bottoming out my trolling motor. I couldn't get away. And before I knew it, I slammed into the shore and started getting bombarded by waves. Got myself out of it. Um, but really, I wasn't very concerned about how the boat was doing. I didn't care if there was a puncture in the bottom from the rocks, didn't care about any of that. There's no way the boat can sink. And there's no way the boat's going to overflow with water. It's going to build right out. It's meant to do things. I mean, if it just sat there and got completely bombarded over and over again, like got, it got left there, then maybe we might be kind of worried about it. But really, this boat is meant to take a whole lot of damage and still keep on going. So that just happened. And I just go back along casually fishing, uh, trying to redeem myself from that like nothing else happened. And, you know, it was it was OK. Eventually, the storm got worse and I I had to leave. But well, before that, it was fun. <laughs> Well, special thanks to the audience for challenging me to build a boat that is conservative for I found new strengths in a conservative build versus just trying to max out a tackle junkie platform like we always do. Trying to stuff 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag isn't always the best. I mean, I do miss all the stowage. That's why I did it all. But I do enjoy the big gigantic cockpit and what that has to offer. And somehow I still have a million rods on the deck 
because of those benches. And I still was able to store my crucial tackle. I just got to be a little bit more selective. If you create too much of a favorable environment and there are no problems for you to kind of struggle through, then you start to get kind of laxed and stagnant. I did notice that when I had to actually deal with lack of storage mods that we came up with new ideas to solve storage mods problems, hence all the drop in tackle features. I can also appreciate that because there is a much more conservative layout with less hatches, that there was more places and more voids inside the boat to put port foam in, which ultimately made this boat extremely stiff. Like we went airborne in these waves a few times and even speared a few waves. And uh, normally that would shake and rattle a tin boat to death and you would hate it, but this really just kind of plowed through and ate all of it. I also attached a grab handle. That is a crucial. I don't care if it's calm seas or stuff like this. You need a little grab handle right where your other hand sits. If you're sitting on one side or you're staring with your left hand or your right, you need to have a grab handle adjacent or maybe one on both sides, just in case you got a co-angler who's weird. But anyways, that's it for this one. Got a Palm Prowler build that I finished the build and I just got to finish the video series and I got some other big stuff coming down the pipeline. Huge things, guys. You got to wait for all of it. So I will see you on the next one. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and share. Catch you guys later. Peace.